yesterday our topic by necessity was one that was a communal one, something that touches upon the entirety of the needs of the Jewish people as a whole. Today's topic is a more personal one for us, I hope, but at the same time, all is linked in life. I believe that one of the great strengths of our people as a people is our capacity to be contemplative, to review the meaning of our lives, to seek to improve those lives. So in that vein, I begin with this reflection. It took longer than we expected, but Nancy and I are empty nesters. Donnie, who has Down syndrome and autism, moved a few months ago, just shy of his 40th birthday, into a group home administered by JCL, the Jewish Association for Community Living. He has learned to share space with five other adults, has adapted to a new routine, no small matter for him, and continues to work each day while having his needs lovingly attended to. Even though it happened about 20 years after we first began the process, it's disorienting, even as it is comforting. A lifelong family experience has shifted addresses. Not easy, but it's for the good. I think most of us know that experience for ourselves. How long has it ever taken you to feel at home in a new location? How much energy and steadfastness and time has it taken? It can take years for a new address to truly feel as if it's home. This whole phenomenon of leaving home is a central part of Torah as well. Every Torah reading in Haftarah over these last two days is about a parent dealing with a child leaving home. Abraham, who is so anxious when his son Ishmael is sent into the wilderness, Ishmael's mother Hagar coping tearfully with his uncertain fate and the future the boy now faces. The long hoped for birth of Hannah's son Samuel soon after the baby is weaned, that's yesterday's Haftarah, he begins a lifetime of dedication to God, but away from home. And this morning, the readings about Isaac and the unexplainable demand that Abraham bind the boy upon an altar as a sacrifice, it takes place at Har Hamoriah, Mount Moriah, again, away from home. Three days journey, in fact. And the painful scene of Rachel weeping for her children as they leave her and this doesn't even begin to include the reality that so many other biblical characters leave home themselves, including Abraham, Jacob, Rebecca, Rachel, Leah, and Moses. Why so much emphasis on the kids leaving the nest? Torah must have known that not everyone who would read these words would have children. And why did our sages decree that these readings take place on Rosh Hashanah? I think because at this time of examination and hopeful change, we are all, in a very real sense, children leaving home. Our lives are moving into the arid wilderness of uncertainty, maybe even into the unknowable. It's not easy. There are no clean breaks. Like a good number of people, some years ago, I came down with a case of shingles. So much fun. Fortunately, a mild case. In the back of my mind, I remembered that the culprit was the same virus that caused chickenpox as a child. That 10 days of itching and scratching misery. Why couldn't it be just one and done? <laughs> Adulthood is supposed to be about leaving all those painful parts of the past in the rearview mirror. We all know, though, that sometimes the past has a way of lying in wait to anticipate just the right time or the wrong time to rear its pretty ugly head. As Faulkner famously put it, the past is never dead. In fact, it's not even past. Hesitation has deep roots. And how to prepare for any moves ahead. It's an old classic story about the little boy who was so angry with his parents that he decides to run away. He knew he would need food, so he threw some cans of beans and corn into his backpack and started on the way. After a couple of miles, it got dark and he grew hungry. 
He opened up his backpack, but there was no way he could eat anything because, of course, he forgot the can opener. Who hasn't felt ill-equipped for a new stage or place in life? Rabbi Alan Lua, Blessed Memory, Rabbi Lou's beautiful book, bears the title, This is Real and You Are Completely Unprepared. Sound familiar? I like the way Samuel Johnson, the writer, captured change when it finally does begin to happen. When seeing a friend undertake a new role or task for the first time, he would say, it's like watching a walrus trying to figure skate. It wasn't good, but you were impressed that you were seeing it at all. I think I know that walrus. Though challenging to employ, we are given a gift by our tradition, a gift to prepare for the next stages of life, to in essence plow the seeds of the familiar in order to sow the seeds of change, to arrive at a new abode of meaning. Enter these days of awe of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. It's a time of celebration of the new and challenge at the same time. It's a time of three things. We'll call them the three R's. Reflection, regret, repentance. Reflection. There is a piece of this process that has a lot in common with mindfulness. To pay attention in Hebrew, la sim lev, literally to put your heart on the matter, to notice, to be aware, even to let your breath be a guide. The Hebrew words for soul and breath are in essence the same, neshama, neshima. But the term most often used for that kind of reflection is cheshbon hanefesh, literally taking an account of the soul. It's a time to ask pointed questions of ourselves. Am I the kind of person I imagine myself to be? What is my duty in this world? What must I do to become the kind of person I ought to be? What is my duty in this very moment, in this situation? In the words of our tefillot, in the words of our prayers, me'anu me'chayenu. Who are we and what are our lives truly about. It's been said that one of the largest distances in life is that 20 inches, the 20 inches between head and heart. I can think of another one, the distance between whom we imagine ourselves to be and who we really are. Technology, even without AI, makes that an easy chasm to create. Anyone can create an online persona far different than the real person, so wide you could drive a fleet of trucks through it. Who is that real person on the screen in front of us, we would wonder, or for that matter, the one staring back at us at the mirror. The gap is obvious when a person pontificates about virtue and turns out to be a fraud, a cheat, a thief. But you know the power of that simple exchange when husband and wife were bickering, the classic story, and finally an exasperated husband finally says, you should have married a better man. And the wife's response is very simply, I did. There is no holier than thou here. Annie Lamott, favorite writer of mine, describes a reality in the world of religion when she incisively suggests you know you've created God in your own image when you realize that God hates all the same people you do. <laughs> After about 12 years from moving from our childhood house, I said to my sister one day on impulse, let's go visit the old house. And so we did. We parked in front of the old abode and went right up to the door, knocking on it and said to the surprised woman who opened it, we used to live here. Okay, if we come in and take a look around? I'm a little surprised that we said that in the first place. Even more surprised that she said, sure. And so we did. And we looked around and we wondered, what happened to that huge set of front steps that we could barely climb? The front door that towered over us, the big living room and the roomy kitchen, it was familiar, but so small. It seemed as if that world shrunk before us in real time. 
And I tell you, I've wondered ever since that experience, knowing that a piece of that home will always remain with me, has my personal growth, my character, grown in proportion to the physically larger person that I am now and who left that home of smaller proportions behind. I can only hope and pray that I am. When we engage in our search, our accounting of the past, our cheshbon hanefesh, we will meet inevitably with a word, a world of regret, the chances we failed to seize, the decisions we would love to do over. A young woman named Bonnie had a grandmother who was her greatest confidant growing up. As she grew older and busier, she called her grandmother less. Her grandmother wasn't so adept at email, FaceTime. Frequently thinking, Bonnie said she would write her a letter someday. Bonnie learned that her grandmother passed away. That evening, Bonnie sat at her desk, staring at the blank page with a letter she was always meant to write where that letter would have gone. The realization that she had lost the opportunity to express her love and gratitude to someone so important to her haunted her. The unwritten letter became a symbol of things left unsaid. How many unwritten letters, how many blank pages do we have in our lives? For everyone's sake, friends, write the letters now, call now, send the text now, communicate now. We all know that you just never know. Many of us find it difficult to imagine doing something ourselves we know would be very little effort on our part, as simple as shopping for someone in need, delivering some groceries, spending time with someone who is ill. Meep Gies was the friend who ran errands for the Anne Frank family when they were hiding from the Nazis. She put her life on the line every time she went out of the door and ran errands. She would later say that the small act of friendship and of honesty, of kindness, was like turning on a small light in a dark room. Her bravery is humbling. When you think of these things and feel a pinprick of conscience, celebrate it. It's a sign of our humanity. And to act upon it, a sign of simple human greatness. And so repentance, teshuva, literally a turning, an embrace of the possibility of doing different in order to be different, greater sensitivity, greater generosity, greater kindness, and a willingness to be inspired by great example. For those wondering when the obligatory baseball reference would come into play given the season, here it is. <laughs> Told by author Ryan Holiday. When he connected with the ball, Frank Robinson was positive that it would be going over the Fenway Park left field wall. So positive that he ran at half speed to first base, watching the ball soar deep toward the green monster. Then suddenly, the ball came up short and ricocheted down to the waiting left fielder. Robinson had to settle for a single when he might have had a double or a triple had he hustled. <clears throat> in the end, the Orioles won in a blowout, a mistake that easily would have been forgotten but one of his 10,000 at-bats in his 21-year career, except that afterward, Robinson walked into the manager's office slammed down $200 on the manager's desk. He hadn't broken any rules, but had given less than his best. And his failure cost the team. He was fining himself. He was his own umpire, his own referee. We can be that kind of referee for ourselves, too, in this world, you know. Because when we build muscles of character, we can then find the wisdom and resilience to find ourselves when necessary, to change ourselves. And that is how we become a blessing to us all, all around us. So let us leave the home of tired failures, of static patterns of inertia and 
hurtful deeds. Let us surrender the myopia of missed chances. Let us not mortgage our future on the backs of self-satisfied complacency. Let us use the pathways, reflection, regret, repentance, to move ahead. And though it is daunting to do that, remember this. Our tradition tells us that God has separation anxiety. God desires that we come closer together to change in order to grow in spiritual partnership and deep gratitude. And with that in mind, I close with a story from the Hasidic tradition. There was once a king who had a son who had to leave home because that's the way of the world. It's something he had to do. The child wandered throughout the world and developed his own voice, his own interests, his own way of doing things. But the king missed his child and wanted to see him now that he was an adult himself. One day the king sent ministers to find his son and ask him to return. When they located him, he answered, he could not return to the kingdom. He was no longer the boy who had left years before. So many things had changed. He was no longer a royal prince. He was his own person. The ministers brought back the sad news to the king, and the king said, bring my son the following message. Return as far as you can, and I will come the rest of the way to meet you. God and significance in a new residence of joyful meaning. It can happen, you know. It can happen. And so to our own Sandani, may you grow and thrive in your new home. We will remain nearby as long as we possibly can as you take root in the place you need to be. And as for all of us, may the Eternal One meet us all halfway as together we move into a better future together.